Welcome to episode 200 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us listener. Today is a Chamonix special. Chamonix has always been one of my favourite resorts so it's such a pleasure to be able to share it with you listener. But we're going to look at the different ski areas, who it's best for and who it's not and explore a little bit of the history of this famous resort. I was also lucky enough to be at the Kandahar World Cup slalom race, which took place there last weekend. So we're going to hear from some of the British racers, Dave Riding, Billy Major, Laurie Taylor. And on top of that, we also have a chat with the best of the next generation, Zach Carrick-Smith, who won three medals at the Youth Olympic Games last month. Now, my name's Ian Martin. I would like to introduce my guest today. I'm delighted to welcome back to the show another incredibly successful British skier, Telemark skier, Jasmine Taylor. Hi, Jasmine. How are you? Hello, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much, because I was lucky enough to be in Chamonix last week. I believe that you are in Chamonix right now, is that correct? I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm based in Les Uches for the winter, so yeah, I love it here. Yeah, well, I'm very jealous of you. A question I like to ask my guests at this point is, when did you ski or snowboard last? So I presume you went out today then, did you? I did, yeah, about an hour ago. Training today, or uh, do you ever get any time off uh, for your own skiing? It's actually a very rare day of just free skiing for myself. So, yeah, it was really nice, actually. Do you go out on telemark skis, or you do you go on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, regular skis? I know telemark, of course, always. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Always. Excellent. <laughs> and how did it? How did you find the snow today, then, Jasmine? Oh, it's quite hard, but then you got kind of like the top surface that softens up a bit. So it's a bit like spring skiing, which I quite enjoy. A lot of people don't like it, but I, I really love it. I think we all like a bit of spring skiing, not necessarily at the beginning of February is the only point uh, I would make on that. I've got a few snow reports from different contributors. Let's have a listen to what they say about the snow uh, from uh, Tim out in the Italian Dolomites, Jen in La Plan, and Dave, who is over in Switzerland. Buonasera a tutti and hello from the Italian Dolomites, specifically the Val Gardena, which is where I am at this moment in time. Look, first I'd like to talk to anybody who might be booked to come to the Dolomites in the next week or so, because when you arrive, wherever you arrive from, maybe Venice or Innsbruck, as you get into the Dolomites, you are going to go into a flat spin because there is no snow on the lower mountains. I mean, it's stark, it's green. You know, I even commented about the, uh, uh, the, the green uh, forests uh, earlier on today. Quite remarkable. But the good news is that the world-class uh, snow management here in the Dolomites means that the slopes are actually in superb condition. And I exaggerate not. We've got two groups out at this moment in time. Uh, one group arrived yesterday, their first ski day today. They're all internationals. And they've had a wonderful day. Uh, their words, uh, not mine. So, yes, things are getting a little bit soft. Temperatures on the top of the Sajeda are at about 2,500 metres. At lunchtime today, we're around about 6 degrees. But uh, Italian, uh, the Dolomiti Superski are reporting 1,200 kilometres of slopes open. That's 100%. And 421 of the 450 lifts. We are expecting precipitation over the weekend. Fingers crossed it's going to be snow and not rain. My name's Tim Hudson from Inspired Italy. Enjoy your skiing wherever you're going. Ciao. Hi, Ian and the Ski Podcast. This is Jen coming to you live from La Plan again for another snow report. And I am reporting today. It is hot and sunny outside. I say hot, you know, we're looking at like two degrees <laughs> it was hot in the alps um and we've had consistently blue sunny skies for the last 10 days or so and regularly above zero degrees so it has been a really warm kind of two weeks or a bit longer in the alps so um the snow conditions that's what everybody's talking about you know what is the snow actually like is there enough snow is that the end of the ski industry um i can happily say no it's looking really fab up here in la plan we've got really actually excellent snow conditions we did have some quite icy piece a couple of weeks back when we had a bit of rain in resort but since then the um, resort teams have done a great job of really bashing the piece and getting everything back in great condition so I would say kind of early morning we're looking at really nicely hard packed groomed pieces and um, they're softening up throughout the day so those south facing slopes definitely softening up a lot more throughout the day not slushy not spring slush by any means but they are kind of softening up 
and those north facing slopes are staying more consistently kind of hard packed throughout the rest of the day um so i yeah i think there's really kind of great snow and ski conditions and that is all the way down to montchavan and lacoche montal there so uh, you can kind of ski everywhere in the resort it's all open um so yes there is enough snow in resort so yes you should come skiing <laughs> don't listen to those british tabloids um, we are kind of picking up ready for the February half term. It's getting busier in resort. So we've had quite a busy January and February is picking up. And um, what I would say is we're a big enough resort that everyone's kind of really spread out quite nicely. I find that there are some bottlenecks at the queues, at the lifts, um, at those peak times. So kind of when the ski school's kicking off at 10 o'clock in the morning or when everyone's heading back for lunch at like 12, 12.30. So if you can kind of avoid those points at those times, I definitely recommend it. Um, that's pretty much it for me. The last thing I should say, of course, is the temperature's dropping this weekend and we've got some snow on the forecast, which is really exciting. Um, we're probably about five or six centimetres. It's not going to be a huge amount, but it's great to see the temperatures dropping back down below zero and there's to have some snow coming in on the forecast. So uh, keep listening or watch this space to see what happens there. And hopefully we'll see you on the slopes at some point this winter. Thanks. Bye. Hello Ian, it's Dave from Snow Pro Ski School, the number one English speaking ski school in Villar on the Port de Soleil and I hope that you are all well. Uh, you asked me to give you a snow report, here I am. Um, I'm sitting here waiting for the Mosset lift to open here. Uh, I'm here in Le Crozet, 1600 metres and do you know what? I, I'm surprised at how good the snow is still, even after like, it must be a month now of like hot and warm weather, I'm looking at the piece, pieces are in perfect condition, everywhere I look, perfect condition, alright, there's not a lot of off piece, but the pieces are immaculate today, um, and that's kind of been the picture uh, of it a little bit, in the afternoon it's slushy, it's a bit springtimey, give you that, but in the morning, piece conditions are amazing, so it's a little bit like skiing, in kind of April or Easter time where you'd kind of make the most of it in the morning and then, you know, ski some slushy, bumpy stuff in the afternoon, which is pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, it's all right, you know. Um, and what you know what I really, really like about this time of the season or weather like this, because we all often in the Alps here, we get this long, long period of high pressure, right? And it's not an unusual thing, despite what you might read in the Daily Mail or whatever, okay? There's loads of snow up here. But what's really good about it is that you come out of your house, you don't have to, stunt, like at my house, you don't have to shovel your way out of the, the driveway, right? You don't have to dig yourself out, which I'm absolutely sick of these days. Um, and what you do is you just drive up to the resort, nice, clean, dry roads, like, everything's great. You arrive at the ski resort and there's snow. You literally just step out onto a perfect piste. So um, I've been very, very much enjoying this period, you know, like firm pistes, beautiful sunshine, lovely sunny terraces. Like, it's, what, it's what the people want frankly uh, i think it's been it's been a wonderful period of time the weather's about to turn so come wednesday wednesday thursday friday saturday sunday so sunday just in time for uh the mega half term week because all the countries are on holiday at the same time this year um we have then some snowy weather coming so there's like top up of snow wednesday top up of snow friday top up of snow on sunday and uh, that's going to make i think all the difference take a little bit of the hardness out of the surface and get some soft snow again so uh, so yeah pretty good here i have to say i'm surprised how well everything's holding up um from a very sunny beautiful port de soleil uh have a great day everyone thanks for all you do and uh, keep up the great work and see you all soon bye so interesting uh, feedback on the uh, snow there you could say it's still winter in the mountains and maybe spring in the uh, valley. When I was in Chamonix, I skied the different areas and actually posted a snow report uh, on video on the Skipedia YouTube channel uh, every day. So you can have a look and see what I thought of things there. I did use my carve again. Regular listeners will know I've got a carve device and I managed to get my ski IQ up to 149, which is my best for this season so far, which I'm very pleased to, to see for me anyway, puts me second on the leaderboard uh, in Chamonix. But I mentioned those different ski areas. And so if, listener, you're not familiar with Chamonix, it's not like the Three Valleys. You don't have all this big ski area that's all connected with lots of lifts in between. Essentially, you have you know, four different ski areas. And so Jasmine today was uh, out in Les Ouches, which as you're driving into the valley, you'll find on the right-hand side. Uh, and that's the first ski area. How would you describe the skiing in uh, in Les Ouches, Jasmine? 
Uh, it's probably more family friendly. You have all the race clubs training there as well. And yeah, if, if you want to learn to ski or you've got kids, probably Les Ouches is your best bet. Yeah. And I think as well, a lot of people who spend a season in Chamonix or depending on your weather conditions, Les Ouches is also a little bit better if there's snow and if it's a whiteout because you've got the tree skiing there as well, haven't you? Right. It's a bit lower. So we we tend to have um, less harsh weather conditions compared to the greater heights of Chamonix yeah when I first took my first ever holiday to uh, Chamonix we stayed in Les Ouches and uh, that was in 1981 so uh, I won't uh, tell you exactly how old I was but I was uh, I was pretty young <laughs> you know back in those days mm. um, now if you keep moving up the valley you come into town and uh, you'll see up on the uh, left hand side as you're coming into town the Brevent uh, Flagère ski area a couple of ways to uh, access it there's those uh, gondolas from both Brevon and uh, Flagère on those sides. Now, I really like this uh, area. We did our first day skiing there last week. It's kind of, I would say, different from some other ski resorts you might go to. There are blues up there that would never be blues in other resorts. They'd definitely be reds in other resorts. It kind of has a sense that, you know, they've maybe made a few of them blues to get a few uh, on the map, particularly if you go onto the uh, Brevent side and if you go up the top of the Brevent cable car, there's some black runs coming down from there and some brilliant, if the conditions allow, backcountry off-piece runs coming down off the uh, top of uh, Brevent. When I was there last week, you couldn't ski back down to the uh, valley. You'd have to catch the uh, gondola down. And the snow was, you know, okay without being, um, you know, brilliant. It was a bit sugary. Possibly they'd had the snow cannons on and some of that was uh, left. But, you know, there's some excellent uh, skiing uh, up there. Jasmine, have you uh, spent much time in, in Brevon and or Flagère? I've skied there once or twice. Honestly, I I don't get much time on that side of the valley, <laughs> but it's it is a it is a great ski area though. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun, definitely. Certainly, if you take that Brevon uh, cable car and assuming you're with someone who knows what they're uh, doing, then go skiers left. There's various ridges and options for coming down there that are that are fantastic. Moving on, continuing uh, down through the valley, pass through the town, and I'm skipping by a couple of uh, beginner slopes. There are beginner slopes in Chamonix. There's Planar, where they have the uh, luge, and uh, there's another one called the Savoy or Savoy uh, lift, which is round behind the Folly Deuce Hotel. And you could just, you know, learn to ski there if you're a complete beginner. But if you keep going through the town, you'll end up in uh, Argentière. That's about a 20 minute drive or so. And from Argentière, you can go up to the Grand Monte ski area. And this really is a legendary uh, ski area. I absolutely love it up there. When I've been skiing in Chamonix over the years, it has, if any of you are listening in the States and you've been to Arapahoe Basin, in some respects, that place when I went to Arapahoe Basin really reminded me of Grand Monte. There's not many lifts. And there's a massive ski area up there. And the off-piece options, which is really, uh, to me, the real benefit, the real draw of Grand Monte, are huge. They've been curtailed a little bit because, uh, listener, you may know there was a fire in 2018 in the mid-station of the cable car there. And so the actual cable car that takes you up to the top point, 3,300 metres, hasn't been running. Uh, but you can take a lift up to the top of Boshar and you see ski tourers every day ski touring up to get that extra height and then coming down the Argentier Glacier and taking some of the routes down there. Uh, Jasmine, I re- appreciate that you're often on the road and you're competing and racing in Les Ouches, your hometown. Um, do you get up to Grand Monte? Have you skied there before? Yeah, it's the second most skied area probably for me, and I really love it as well. You've got some really steep runs, and it's it's that bit higher. If snow conditions are lacking a bit in Les Ouches, that's where we that's where we go. Yeah, and the other side to it is it not only does it have that height, it's north facing uh, as well. So it maintains its snow in, in better condition than, for example, that Brevon Flagère side, which is on the south facing uh, side, on the opposite side of the uh, valley. Uh, I'd also chip in in Grand Monte, since I last went, the snow park has really improved and they've got um, a couple of skier board across runs down there, which are, are great fun. They're definitely, even those are kind of a, a higher degree of difficulty compared with uh, other resorts. And I 
love the fact that they've got the gates at the top and you swipe your uh, lift pass and then it, you hear these bells ringing and it counts you down and mm. you can ski off together and you get a time at the bottom of the course, which is good for uh, kind of bragging rights and uh, and things like that. But, you know, in general with Grand Monte, you know, I just love that uh, area. And, you know, when I was doing seasons uh, in the Three Valleys back in the 90s, I'd come over and ski with friends in Chamonix. And I used to think that I was, you know, one of the better skiers uh, in the Three Valleys. But when I came over to Chamonix, it was a, like a real reality check. It attracts so many good skiers in Chamonix, and a lot of them are in, on Grand Monte, whether they're Swedes or Americans or French uh, or, or anyone. They're coming from all over the world to that destination. So if you're listening to this and you're more of a, you know, an advanced skier, then that is uh, definitely a place that wants to be on your list. Now, if you continued on through the valley, um, on the way to the Col de Monte and before you come to Valocine, you can go off to the right and go up to uh, La Tour, which is also known as the uh, Balm area. And this is a really popular uh, area. It's actually much more um, accessible for all ability levels. Um, there's some really nice blues. So you could actually ski all the way to the bottom there as well instead of having to take the lift down. I should say in Grand Monte, you could ski all the way to the bottom as well. Yeah, with that Latour area, it's much more accessible to people of all ability levels. And it's actually some really nice uh, kind of cruising there, a couple of really good blues where you can get up a good bit of uh, speed. And you can also ski down in good conditions as far as Valocene. They probably put that lift in, I'm guessing, about 10 years ago, something like that. Um, as it was at the moment, if you wanted to go to Valocene, then you could, uh, you'd could you have to catch the uh, the bubble down. But I um, really enjoyed skiing over there. And there's more sunshine, I would say, uh, obviously on Brevent Flegere, south-facing side, there's sunshine. But uh, in La Tour, you're going to get a bit more than in Grand Monte uh, overall. Uh, I know it's a long way for you, Jasmine. Do you ever get over to La Tour? Again, once or twice. But I really like the ski area. It's sunny and uh, the pistes are really wide. And the snow was great when I was there. Yeah, I had a, I had a really nice time. Recommend it. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, ski touring routes up there just for if you'd like to uh, go out. They're kind of uh, uh, marked. Uh, you can catch the lift down or ski down, however you want to do it. Quite a few options like uh, like that. And there are some good um, off-piste routes as well going down towards uh, Valocene and the chairlift on that side. Now, one thing that we need to mention, so listener, if you're probably getting a feel for Chamonix in the different areas – but you have these four different areas. They're not connected by lift. You have to get around the valley. Now, this is one of the differences between Chamonix and, let's say, some of the other big French resorts like La Plan and Les Arcs and the Three Valleys, etc. You need to either have a car or catch the bus or catch a train. You can catch a train realistically to Valorcine. It doesn't really work for going to... I mean, you can catch a train to um, Argentier and probably it's maybe like a 10-minute walk to the lift. The Les Uches, uh, railway station isn't actually anywhere near uh, the lift itself. But there's a really good bus service uh, which runs all around the uh, valley. But you just need to be mindful that you're going to have to get it, uh, onto the bus. It, you know, it wasn't a problem for us. You have to wait a couple of times, but no more for us uh, than 15 minutes or so for any uh, bus. I'm guessing, Jasmine, you travel around by car if you were going to one of the other resorts living there, as you do. Um, yeah, normally get picked up in the team van. Uh, <laughs> by the coach but otherwise uh yeah car or the bus to be honest the bus is they're really quite good yeah i mean they are good and there's a really good timetable and it covers uh, all of the different areas but you know i mentioned before that you know for me you can go on a family holiday to Les Uches. and i think if you were going on a family holiday with like younger children or a lower ability group then Les Uches would probably be the right place to base yourself because then you can be much nearer to the lifts and you can go straight onto the mountain. If you if you were staying in Centre Chamonix, which has an amazing selection of restaurants and bars, etc., then you're going to have to uh, you know get on a bus to get to the ski areas. And sometimes you know if you've got young kids and need to get them in their boots and carry their skis and all this, that might be a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, now, there's a couple of other options in relation to skiing. And uh, listener, you may have heard of uh, the Valley Blanche very famous long off piece run that goes from the top of the Agui de Midi. That's 3,842 metres. And the Agui de Midi, whether you're going to ski the Valley Blanche or not, I strongly recommend 
that you go up there during the course of your stay in Chamonix. There really is nowhere like it anywhere. It's so dramatic. You know, you're starting off at a thousand meters in Chamonix itself, going up to 3,842 meters in the space of you know, around uh, 20 minutes or so, something like that. And you notice that altitude as soon as you get to the top. And there, there's so many different features and viewing platforms and information up there when you do get to the top. One of them covers, yeah, the effects of altitude on the body and the reduction in oxygen. It's actually not quite as bad as I uh, thought. I think you have 65% of the available oxygen at 3,840 meters. Um, but you'll still notice that if you come out of the lift and try and run up the stairs, for example, or something like that. Um, but it's it's so good up there. I just love it. Um, Jasmine, have you been up to the Agui de Midi? And, and have you ever skied the Valley Blanche? Yeah, I have a couple of times. And yeah, it's brilliant. And views are phenomenal. And yeah, but of course, take a guide, somebody very experienced, because it is, yeah, it's, it's completely off piste. It's, you have to take care. With, with that kind of skiing. So uh, I wouldn't go on my own for that. Absolutely. No way would you go uh, on your own. I mean, I do know people who've, uh, who've done it on their own. Maybe you've done a lot of seasons. But the thing about skiing over a glacier, such as that, is the snow bridges, which you're going over crevasses on, change the whole time. And there's no way I would ever have the confidence or be foolish enough to choose to do that. So I think I've done the Valley the Valley Blanche three times. First time on that trip in 1981, and I guess the most recent one might have been 15 years ago now or something like that. Uh, but the biggest, or let's say, the first challenge that you've got—I wouldn't say it's necessarily difficult skiing. There are different routes that you can go down, but the first challenge is getting down the arete, which is the ridge from the Agui de Midi to the area where you can start skiing. And, uh, Jasmine, that's quite, gets your heart beating, that section, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not your average walkway, is it? It's really quite something. Were you roped up, your group, when you did that? Yeah, we were, if I remember rightly, you clip onto the the kind of railing as you go, boot crampons, this kind of thing, if it's icy, and then you get to a, a flatter section, then you can put your skis on and, choose which route you want to take um but the views are just breathtaking and like you said it, it's not necessarily a difficult ski but you do need to know what you're doing but it's quite an experience it, i mean it's really it's really magic i mean i would recommend it for any uh, advanced skier as something that you should uh, try and do at least once in your life i'd say so yeah yeah when you get to the bottom of the Valley Blanche, you come out um, just below Montanvert, which some of you will know. There's a uh, rack and pinion railway that takes you up to Montanvert. Now, when I did it in 1981, there wasn't even a gondola there at all. You just walked up uh, from the bottom. But, uh, you know, sadly, and uh, anyone who watched Ski Sunday uh, last weekend will be aware of this, that the glacier, the Mare de Glace there, has retreated uh, significantly and reduced uh, in size. And it's reducing in, in the depth, which means that pretty much every year since uh, I was doing it then, They've added in more steps for you to be able to get up to that gondola to get out. And as it goes, while I was there last week, they opened a new gondola to reduce the number of uh, steps that people have to walk. And, uh, you know, it's pretty sad that that is the case. But this is one of the realities. This is global warming in the mountains, you know, as well as that. Uh, later on this year, they will be opening a, uh, opening a new uh, glacier and climate centre there in Montanvert. So that, that's a really good, you know, non-ski option for people if they want to go up there and have a look at that. If you've got a mixed ability uh, group, we'd actually get to Montanvert this time because there's so many things to do in Chamonix. You just don't have the time uh, to do it. Uh, you know, for example, you've got uh, you could you could easily go hiking if you want to, depending on the snow conditions. You've got cross country uh, in the valley there. Have you done cross country uh, there, or you know, you're a telemarker? Does that cross over to cross country, Desmond? Do a lot of cross country skiing. Yeah, in Lazouche, top of Lazouche, and also Chamonix, like you said. Clearly, I, I went for a run on the Saturday morning. And there were so many people out on those uh, cross-country trails, like the Club de Sport, but lots of people obviously just going out for a day. Yeah, it's popular. Super popular. You know, as well for uh, non-skiers, um, I actually went along and tried out a spa that is in town as well called the QC Term. And that place is amazing. 
it really is incredible. I couldn't believe how many people were there, given that it cost you know sixty euros to uh, to go in. There is a collection of outdoor spas and indoor saunas and herman and you know jet uh, jacuzzi type things and cold water uh, areas, and it's just uh, so impressive. I just couldn't believe it uh, there. Have you have, have you ever been to that place, Jasmine? I haven't. No, but you've sold it, so I perhaps should go and try it out. <laughs> right. Yeah, go and have a look. It really is uh, amazing. So that's, you know, we managed to fit that in. And then I mentioned, you know, in terms of Chamonix itself, while Les Uches is a thriving uh, kind of town in itself, the centre of Chamonix, it is a proper uh, town. You know, the history of Chamonix has been going for a, a long time, a long time before it was a ski resort. So there are a lot of restaurants there. Um, a lot of bars, and they really got everything to cover. You know, while we were there, Ireland were playing France at rugby. We went past one of the bars called the Pub, and they're all singing in there. You can hear all the French singing the Marseillaise, and the Irish fans are kind of ribbing them because Ireland won that one. You've also got very smart uh, bars as well. Uh, there's a, a bar that used to be called the Terrasse. Uh, I remember it in the days when it was where they used to hand out the prizes, uh, you know, the uh, boss to boss. These days, it's a very kind of posh uh, type of bar called the uh, Pont de Rose. Uh, and we went in there and uh, had a drink. And that's very lovely. Amazing position. Great place to watch the uh, sunset in the center of uh, Chamonix. And then for eating out, you've kind of got everything from, you know, Poco Loco, which I used to go to a lot when I worked there in 1996, which is, you know, after you've been out and had a few drinks, you can go and get yourself, uh, uh, you know, some chips or a burger or something like that. To amazing. I mean, there is a, a Michelin star restaurant there. I didn't go to that, but I did actually go to the place next door called the Maison Carrier. And this is a really beautiful uh, restaurant. You know, it was restored by the family who owned the hotel next door. They reclaimed all the wood from uh, chalets uh, in the area and kind of built this restaurant up. And they, it's obviously, well, I don't know if it is obvious, but one of these places where the menu is uh, populated with products from the local area. So there's a real theme on the uh, the Chamonix Valley and the uh, Haute Savoie, et cetera. Uh, have you got any favorite places for, for eating out, Jasmine, either in Les Ouches or in town? I mean, there's a nice restaurant up the mountain I like in La Zouche, uh, La Chat. I don't know if you've been over that side. It's a great place to eat. The boulangeries are really good value and sandwiches mm, are yep. always fresh. And they make up kind of like little hot pot meals, coffees and fresh bread. That's always good value. And yeah, you can normally sit down. And the one at Prairie on La Zouche as well, you can sit outside in the sun. So, I don't know. I'm a simple girl. I just like a a good sandwich. Well, I, I like that as well. And I think you you would find in Chamonix that all options are covered. And I know exactly that boulangerie you're talking about in uh, Prairion because uh, we bought a uh, croissant from there prior to the Kandahar race, which we'll come to a little bit later on. OK, so let's kind of round up, listener. Hopefully that's given you a better idea of Chamonix. Uh, just a quick mention, accommodation. I stayed in an apartment right in the centre of town through a company called Chamonix All Year. And I'll put a link to their website in the show notes if you want to have a look at what they've got to offer now if you are heading to the snow this winter listen don't forget you can save money when you put your ski hire at intersportrent.com and you can use the code ski podcast i got my skis from the uh, intersport shop in chamonix and they got a really interesting system there like a boot scan system it's a digital thing you just stand stand there it scans your feet and it can work out straight away the width the length and also there's a pressure monitor so it can see where the pressure is under your feet and they use that as a way of uh, working out really quickly what type of boots are, are suitable for you and i think you'll find that in most intersport uh, shops uh, this winter so if you do need ski hire and you want to book with intersport you will get a, a guaranteed discount for all ski hire in france austria and switzerland if you use a code ski podcast or you can take the link in the show notes and your basket will just automatically be reduced you don't have to put that code in right jasmine we're going to move to uh, you now. I introduced you as a, a telemark skier. That's kind of very simple way of putting it. Another way of putting it is to say you're Britain's most successful skier of all time. I had a look on the FIS website earlier, and you can tell me if this is right or wrong. Have you now got 50 World Cup podiums? I'm not sure. I actually can't tell you if it's right or wrong. This is the issue, Jasmine. You've, you know, you've had so many 
that you lose count. And there's also four at the World Championships as well. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is not only because you know about uh, Chamonix, but also because you've had such a good season this season so far. I think you've had four first places. Is that an easier one to remember? Uh, yes, I, I have. I have started the season well. That that I can remember. That's quite. <laughs> it's quite recent, so it's not too difficult. Therefore, I'd be right in saying that this is your best season since maybe 2018. Certainly for uh, five or six years. What, what do you think is behind? That strong start to the season. I don't know yet if it's a strong season, just simply because we're about thirty-three percent of the way through. So we've had we've had three rounds of competition, and the first two went very well. Third round, I didn't do so well. So before judging if the season is a good one or not, I, I perhaps wait until the end and then look at it with a bit more perspective but for now I suppose if I look at the events where I did well and the events where I didn't do so well I mean you have luck in there as well of course but aside from the things you can't control the part which you can control I think just my approach in simple terms was more based on what I thought and what I was focusing on it's it's so difficult in ski racing to keep focused on that and not lose yourself to self-doubt or lack of confidence or other people looking really good or like it's it's so hard to stay just in the moment on what you have to do it sounds really simple but it's a very stressful environment but I really found a way to manage that stress particularly in those first four race days I think that approach ultimately dictated the success that's great. Well, you don't have to give your uh, your secret away, but evidently, you know, it is coming together well so far and qualifying that and saying, you know, we're only a third of the way through the season. Maybe it'd be useful. I mean, listeners, we've discussed this before on the podcast and I'll put a link to the show notes of, uh, you know, our previous chats. But do you just want to explain, we know you're a telemarker, but they're different types of telemark racing. Do you want to explain what the disciplines are? Yeah, so we have three disciplines. And in all telemark disciplines, you have four elements. You have a giant skiing component. So like giant slalom, sorry, skiing component. So we ski through a giant slalom with the telemark style. For example, if you ski one gate with alpine position or you trip or for some reason your telemark position is not big enough, you'll have one second added to your time per turn the the aim of the skiing part is to be fast but also to have correct technique uh, because you don't want time added once you ski a fast run we also have a jump with a clearance line and so if you don't clear the line you get a further three seconds added and if you don't land telemark it's another second added and then we have a giant bank turn which is called a wrap if you're Norwegian or a loom if you're French the idea is that you cross your own path And this then takes you into the skate section. It's kind of like a triathlon. You've got the skiing, you've got the jumping, and you've got the cross-country skating, which are the three major components with the added bank turn, the fourth element uh, in every discipline. So then we have a classic event where you have one super long run. You can have up to 60 gates in this run. You can have two jumps, you can have two looms, you can have two or three skate sections. It's an absolute monster and it's about three it can be between two and a half minutes to three minutes of skiing so it's an all-out maximal effort and it's very grueling you then have the sprint discipline which is again a time trial but instead of it being one long run you have two time trials this event lasts around one minute to one minute 30 and then you have the parallel sprint so you have a head-to-head knockout where we have qualification qualification dictates the running order so it would be one versus 16 2 15 3 14 and so on and it's a head-to-head knockout and the winner goes through to the next round until the eventual top three, four, and they have it. So event. lots of different elements in there. Would you say that you have a, a preferred discipline? Well, so the four events I won this season were the sprint and the three events where I didn't do so well. One was a classic, 
well, I say didn't do so well. I finished third in the classic and I had more difficulty with the parallel sprint. But the parallel sprint, you just never know because actually the parallel sprint, I had my best world championship finish. The thing with the parallel is it's, it has a more unpredictable nature. There's still a way to master it. It's just that I guess I have found my way of mastering the sprint more so than the parallel. I have more difficulty to regulate it. That. it's interesting what you say about the uh, longer race there because th- i think you just said three to four minutes and to put that into context this now i don't know if you ever watched uh, you know ski racing but uh, a slalom race you know might be taking you certainly less than a minute it could be as little as you know 45 seconds or something like that and a downhill race you know a long one of those is going to be around two minutes or something like that that's a long time to be skiing and not only are you taking on gates you're doing jumps you've got berms uh, in in there as well that must be pretty you've got to be pretty knackered by the time you got to the bottom of one of those right uh, yeah i mean they used to be more like three to four minutes but it's it's getting shorter it's more two and a half minutes to three minutes but it's still a long time to be skiing and skating and jumping so you'll see as well in the top 10 even the top five there can be big time differences in telemark And if you're looking at this with an alpine ski racing eye, you'd think it's, wow, this is crazy, massive time gaps. But it's not. It's the difference between clearing the line by half a foot or not clearing the line by half a foot. It's it's completely it's a completely different discipline and it needs to be uh, regarded in its own in its own light. I don't know. I mean, it's so interesting the way you describe it. It obviously sounds incredibly visually appealing. yet. We sadly, we've talked about this before. One of the reasons, perhaps, uh, listener, why my, many people might not realise that you've got 50 World Cup podiums and a Britain's most successful ever skier is that Telemark is not an Olympic sport. Do you think that ever might change? I think one day it will probably change. I think it would be a great fit for the Olympics. Yeah, I think it's visually a beautiful sport. There's a lot going on. There's so many different components to it. You've got the timed as- aspect and the judged aspect and yeah it's just it's just a great sport well um congratulations to you again for you know how well you've done this season so far and we'll definitely be following your uh, progress what i will do now just turn to uh, other elements of uh, team gb i want to mention uh, mia brooks and zoe atkin they picked up medals at the uh, x games it was a gold for mia brooks and a, a silver for zoe atkin charlotte banks won gold in the snowball cross in uh, Gadari world cup uh, recently and that is a really good result for banks she's had quite a few struggles uh, this year and no podiums to date and i'll put a link to the show notes so you can watch the race amazing finish i mean she was in last place at one point and just came in really strongly at the end there to win i mentioned the uh, kandahar the slalom racing that was over in uh, chamonix Uh, i was in chamonix specifically because uh, these world cup races were going on there were two downhills due to be uh, take place on the friday and saturday and they were cancelled but slalom did go ahead which was uh, really good and i was uh, lucky enough to meet Uh, the British skiers at the end of the race and have a little chat to them. Dave Riding was our best performing skier. He came 11th overall. He was actually only 27th after the first run. Wasn't sure if he was going to get through the next round, Uh, but he did very well. Laurie and Billy didn't manage to qualify for the second run this time, but let's have a listen to what they said. We got Dave Riding coming down on his second run. He's about 0.4 behind final few gates. And he's come in, he's gone into second, but there are only five, four of them down at the moment. So he's done well, much better than his first run. I'm sure he'll be happier with that. Well done, Dave. That's a heroic effort. Beautiful charge on the second run. And you've not been feeling so good this week, right? But just today, really, yeah. I woke up and the man flu struck me down. So, uh, but yeah, second run was really nice. It was the course that suited me, so... I just tried to let it go and, and let my skis just turn them, and it worked. So yeah, well, another ten to go. You're sitting in fourth place. Got yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, let's see. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll see where we finish. Hey, but, uh, no worries. It's so good to meet you in person. Thank you. Appreciate it. So Billy Majors just crossed the line now, and he's not going to be going to second round uh, today. That's two point four six slower. And I think the course is probably getting much harder to ski on. Hi, Billy. 
didn't go so well today, but you've had a great season overall. You know, Kitsville was obviously a really special day, right? Yeah, yeah coming 13th was a PB for me. Um, yeah, just a little inconsistent with the results. My scheme's been quite consistent, but not adapting well to different conditions. So. But your, your ranking is improving the whole time, and I was actually looking a while ago when Dave was your age. You guys are both doing better than he was at, uh, at this age, so he's very confident that you guys are going to progress on. And this is all building that experience, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. We're, yeah, I fully believe in what we're doing and where we're at. Um, yeah, I mean, the two of us, well, the three of us, we're, we're right up there, especially Dave, but we're not far behind and it just... Yeah, it just, it's a bit of a process. Things have to click into place. Well, you know, a season where you get a PB, you get your best ever ranking uh, ever, and I know your family are here today as well. So I'll let you go and say hello to them, but thanks very much, Billy. We've got Laurie Taylor just coming to the bottom of the line. He's He's got a chance of getting through. Go on, Laurie. Oh, 37. Today it didn't maybe work out but it's been a good season overall obviously that an amazing uh, day at uh, Kitsville wasn't it yeah like uh, we've had some like really good really good days and, and really good training like I feel like I'm seeing really well it's just you've got one shot to do it on race day yeah and the conditions like they actually felt they felt fine uh, it, it snows hard bit of a track but it's just it's that kind of gradient if you make a mistake you get so punished yeah yeah well you know i uh, interviewed dave last week and one of the things that we were chatting about was your youtube channel is it really is uh, brilliant behind the brits it gives you such a, a sense so you know thanks for all the work that you put in on that you're welcome you're welcome i enjoy uh, i enjoy making the videos and you know something that i can look at look back on well, they're really, they're really good and they give you a sense of the teamwork, yeah. you know, between all three of you and your coaches and support staff as well, yeah. it's great. One more question and then I'm going to ask about them. So, well, something that cropped up in my chat with Dave, controversial element of Laurie Taylor's career this season, the moustache. Yeah. The thing is, the moustache is fast. <laughs> And I need every hundredth I can get. <laughs> That's brilliant, Laurie. Thanks very much. So, listener, if you'd like to find out more about Dave Riding in particular, our last episode, episode 199, uh, was a, an exclusive interview with Dave. And you can have a listen to that. By the way, listener, if you're one of the first 1,000 or so people to listen to that episode, I have to apologise. There was a bit of an audio issue there in the first 10 minutes or so. We actually missed out. I, my mistake, I put my hand up, used a new piece of software where it stripped out 45 seconds of the podcast so there are a few jumps uh, but if you listen if you want to listen to it again now you'll find it will be uh, working and one of the things Dave said in that interview is he said I am convinced that I won't be the last British Alpine skier to win a World Cup race and uh, with apologies to uh, Jasmine he's talking about the other generations that are coming through not only uh, Billy and Laurie, who uh, are 27, 10 years younger than him and still building their experience, but he was also referring to that generation below them. And you may have heard of Zach Carrick-Smith. Zach Carrick-Smith recently won three medals over in the Youth Winter Olympics uh, in South Korea, and I spoke to him early this week. Excellent. Well, I'm joined right now by Zach Carrick-Smith. And... He has just become a Great Britain's most successful winter athlete ever. You might have read uh, he picked up a couple, of, a couple of golds and a silver at the Youth Olympic Games in Gangwon in South Korea. Uh, Zach, brilliant to have you on the show. Have you managed to get over your jet lag yet? Yep, it took a while, but... It's been like five days since we got back, so we're feeling good. <laughs> you are now the, the third Briton to win gold at a Winter Youth Olympic Games. We had Maddie Rollins in the uh, free ski halfpipe and Ashley Pittaway in the skeleton at uh, Lillehammer 2016. But you've become the first ever Briton to win an Alpine skiing medal for Team GB at any Olympic event. Uh, it may sound a bit of a cliche, but you know, how did it feel when you, when you were at the bottom and you realised you'd clinched the gold? Um, I mean, it it was it was amazing, but it was very unexpected because the first gold was in Alpine combined, which is one run of Super G and one run of Slalom. 
and I didn't have the best of Super G runs, and I was I finished twenty seventh, I think, um, which was just inside the top thirty cut, which really kind of played into my hands because I was starting third on the next run, and then like uh, I mean I had nothing to lose, so I just really gave it my all on that run, and <laughs> I guess it paid off. So. Uh, we were like standing at the bottom and watching everybody just slowly come in front of me. That sounds really interesting because I, I was actually out in Chamonix this weekend at the Kandahar. Yeah. And uh, it became, it was actually the first ever slalom event, I believe, where uh, the person who came 30th at the end of the first run ended up winning, Daniel Yule from yeah. uh, Switzerland. And maybe in some respects, I know in that case, the slope conditions changed. But it does take the pressure off to a certain degree, perhaps. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, uh, if you're leading the run, you have that pressure on you to, well, try and keep that spot. Whereas if you're further down, especially very far down, like 27, 30, if you have nothing to lose, so you can just kind of give it your all. You have a nice, fresh course to... And yeah, so definitely, there's definitely a big advantage for that. You know, that was, as you say, that was just one of the medals. You picked up uh, another <laughs> couple of medals as well. So pretty amazing achievement at the age of uh, just 16. I think maybe you have a birthday coming up soon, but you're just 16 now, right? Yeah, yeah, just 16 at the moment. You've been skiing for a very long time. I know that your parents are both extremely uh, experienced skiers. Your mum went to four Winter Olympics, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And y- your father runs uh, Snowworks, the ski school uh, there. How old were you when you started skiing? I was born in France, so I kind of grew up in the Alps in that environment. I started skiing at around two, probably. Just kind of free skiing, just, you know, skiing with my parents, skiing with a club in teen in the Alps. And then from about six, maybe to eight onwards, that's when we started doing more professional like racing. Yeah, from there on. Six six or eight. So um, if you're listening to this uh, uh, listener and maybe you have a a kid who's keen, get them on the slopes as quickly as you can. You (laughs) mentioned teen just then. I know that, uh, you know, your home is probably Saint-Foy, not far away uh, from teen. But in the winter, you spend most of your time in Austria. Is that right? Yeah, Austria, in a small kind of like ski resort called Vagrein. So I don't know if you know, there's a ski resort uh, near there in Austria called Reiteram, which is where all the top racers ski. Uh, I mean, we often see Schifrin up there, Schifrin, sometimes Hirscher, Odermatt. They're they're all training there. So what, sometimes you're going to tell me you end up sharing a tea bar with them? (laughs) Um, Sometimes, I mean, a little bit with... Charlie Raposo, our British skier, because he trains there a lot. Yeah, well, that's really exciting. And, you know, the listeners uh, might be aware or perhaps will be aware that you have not only a twin brother, Freddie, but an older brother, uh, Luca, as well, who are both ski racers. Yeah. You know, they are uh, very talented in themselves. Um, I think Freddie was over at the World Youth Championships just now and picked up uh, first in the under 18 slalom. Was that on Sunday? Yep, that was it. Um, we were all watching him. <laughs> Very proud of him. That's pretty incredible, really. Uh, you know, I've, I've read elsewhere that, you know, sometimes you say you beat Freddie, sometimes he beats you. How was it that uh, the selection worked in terms of the Olympic Games? It was kind of selected on our point scores, as well as our overall like performances. And since it was both our first year in FIS, uh, there wasn't too many races leading up to it. And to that point, I had lower fist points. So they chose me over him. But it's quite funny because just after that, he's got he went ahead in the points. So it, it was very tight between us, like literally only a point or so. I noticed that you have your own Facebook page called uh, the Carrick Smith Boys uh, on Facebook, where people can follow like all of your progress. Kind of fun sharing stuff on there, right? Yeah. Yeah, we also share stuff on Instagram, on our personal accounts and on Carrie Smith Boys on Instagram. Excellent. Well, I'll I'll put the uh, links into the uh, show notes uh, there. In some respects, you're kind of like your own team training because I was lucky enough to interview Dave Riding uh, the other week and he was talking about the sort of dynamic between him and Billy Major and Laurie Taylor and all working and training together. And do you find that with your brothers as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's great training with them. I mean, we're always pushing each other. And we also, we train with another family, the Butlers, uh, Molly Butler and Matty Butler. Molly, she just came with me to um, the Youth Olympics and she picked up a top 
10 in GS, uh, as well as top 15 in Solom, I think. It is very exciting. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Dave said to me when I was talking to him, and I really love this quote, he said, you know, I guarantee you, I won't be the last British winner of a World Cup race. He's thinking about, you know, Billy and Laurie, who are 10 years younger than him. But he's also yeah. thinking about you guys, who are, we'll call it 20 years uh, younger than him, which is yeah. pretty amazing that there are these two generations you know coming through at the same time it's, it's amazing and we actually we were lucky enough to uh, also have his sister as our coach at the youth olympics uh joe riding so uh it was amazing having her there too she was an amazing coach it was also kind of funny because we had we were watching the kitzball slalom the night before our race uh and we were all like uh celebrating because we had i think we had all three in the top 30 and then the next day is when I went on to win gold. So maybe that gave me a bit of motivation. I mean, it was a glorious week for uh, British skiing. And yeah, that was the first ever for Team GB to have three skiers all in the top 20. And, uh, you know, there's certainly so much promise. I mean, one of the things when I interviewed Dave, I had a look at his FIS record going back to when he was 27. And both Billy and Laurie have got, a, you know, a better uh, fist position than he had at that age and are picking up better results than he had at that age. So, you know, one of the things he stressed to me is how important that experience is in racing, particularly in something like slalom where you're doing the two legs and you know you mentioned before about you know being able to uh, go all out on the second leg and charge so firstly i just want to say congratulations to you uh, yeah. with the timing of our interview maybe you can pass on your congratulations to uh, to to freddie uh, as well yeah. and yeah, yeah. you know wish you all the best uh, for the for the winter what, what's your next event we've just driven over to um bormio in italy for the uh, English Alpine Championships. So we'll be doing that over the next week or so. There you go. They, this will be your opportunity. There won't just be one of you in the race, will there? Yeah. There'll be more of one of you in the race. So sibling rivalry will be to the fore, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think there's there's sibling rivalry, but there's also, um, uh, I guess, because we've always been there, we've always been pushing each other. And like you said, yeah, sometimes I'll be ahead, sometimes Freddie will be ahead. And both of us are also chasing Luca. So this, I think that's one of the reasons why we got where we where we are now well that's brilliant zach thanks for sharing your time and i'm pretty sure as well this is the only interview i fitted around uh, biology and, and math lessons <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> this has been more entertaining than doing that yeah definitely <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks very much zach thank Cheers. you very much for having me thank you so that was really interesting to uh, chat with Zach. Right at the end, his brother came in. We don't think we have the audio uh, on that, but he had just won the slalom at the World Junior Championships. So that is an incredibly uh, talented family. They are uh, twins, and we look forward to see how they're going to progress in the future. Now, another reason I was in Chamonix is because it is this year, the 100th anniversary of the first ever Winter Olympics. They took place in Chamonix in 1924. And I was lucky enough to go on a little tour of the town with a heritage guide called Bernadette Suda, who started me off outside the Marie. And we followed the route that all of the athletes took on that uh, first day, on the opening day, to the ice rink where they had the opening ceremony. So we've got a bit of audio in relation to that. I'm standing here with Bernadette Suda from the Chamonix Tourist Office, and we're doing a kind of a heritage uh, trail. Uh, around Chamonix because it's the 100th anniversary of the first ever Winter Olympics and currently we're standing outside is this the Mairie this building? This is the Mairie the Chamonix yeah. town. Why are we standing here then? First of all because the building is beautiful <laughs> it was a nice hotel before it became the town hall Yeah. and because on the 25th of January the actual opening ceremony the mayor in Chamonix Jean Lavevre will welcome here all the officials and leave with the officials the athletes the um, his his counselors from the town hall uh, everybody will leave from here to walk towards the ice ring where the opening ceremony will take place yeah. where they will pronounce in front of everybody the olympic oath which is really important you will see at the end of the tour why okay right well this is a starting so point let's walk in the footsteps that those initial athletes took and see how we go. Okay, so right now we're walking along uh, Rue Josephalo on the route, on the way to the opening ceremony. And you just told me uh, that 
all of the competitors took their equipment with them. Exactly, a part of their equipment. So the skaters had their skates in the hand, very proud. They had their Olympic uh, dresses on, their jackets with the, the, the embroideries, the flags and everything. Curling teams had the curling brushes. <laughs> the skiers had their skis. Some teams even woke up and have a bobsled. The bobsled uh-huh. team, there no way. <laughs> because there was snow <laughs> on the street ah, and okay. they could drag the yeah. bobsled. That's brilliant. And as we walk along now, Essentially, the view in front of us is very similar to the view they saw back then. Exactly the same, just the people are dressed in a different way. <laughs> so, I really want to thank you for that, uh, Bernadette. That, that was wonderful to literally be walking in the footsteps of the athletes who were making their way to the opening ceremony a hundred years ago. And all of those buildings that exist that are there now, that were there then, it really is, you know, something tremendous you've put together here. Well, thank you very much. I think, you know, I was here a hundred years ago. <laughs> and I'm still really proud to be here today. I can feel like these athletes who had the head straight up walking to there and be part of this event. That's the whole meaning. I think Olympic spirit is this, is being part of it. Yeah, they were pioneers. And, uh, you know, I think everybody who loves watching the Olympics and the Winter Olympic Games would do well to kind of look back at what happened here a hundred years ago. And stay in a simple mind to do what you can, do your best and have an Olympic behaviour. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Bernadette. Merci. So if you come to Chamonix, I think it's really important to understand the heritage there. There's so many aspects of Chamonix. It was a town a long time before it was a ski resort, and that was one of the reasons they were chosen for those first Winter Olympics. Now, moving on to feedback. I enjoy all feedback about the show. I like to know what you think, especially about our features. So please contact me on social at Ski Podcast or by email theskipodcast at gmail.com. Have a few uh, bits of feedback from different listeners. Miranda Slater said, uh, your podcast gets better and better. That's very kind of you, Miranda. Uh, Robin said, enjoyed the interview with Preet. That was episode 198. Um, Oliver Rutman said, enjoyed the South Pole expedition. That was Preet again. What an extreme adventure. Uh, Alan Pinnegar said, just listening to Dave Riding interview. Great content as ever. Thanks, Alan. And Nick Kehler said, love the podcast. Really enjoyed the interview with Preet Chandy. Any podcasts on mono skis? Now, I don't think we've ever covered mono skis. Jasmine, ever been on a mono ski? No, I've never, never been on a mono ski. There is still that school of people out there who fully believe in them. They were, a listener, if you have no idea what a mono ski is, it kind of uh, is what it says on the tin. It's a, a single ski with two bindings fixed in the uh, middle of it. There was quite famous uh, movies in the 80s called Apocalypse Snow that you can probably find uh, on YouTube. Maybe I'll put a link in the show notes about them. I think they still have the uh, European Monoski Championships in Val d'Isere every year. Maybe I should get out to that and uh, interview someone from that at some point. Now, we're going to move towards the close. If you like the podcast, there are three things you can do to help. You can review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I noticed we've got 115 reviews on Apple Podcasts. 46 on Spotify and if you do do it it does actually help other listeners find us Uh, you can subscribe to the ski podcast and that way every episode will automatically be downloaded for you so you can catch up at your leisure and of course you can book your ski hire within sport rent using the code ski podcast or taking the link in the show notes now there are 205 episodes of the ski podcast now to catch up with i had a little look at the stats 143 we listened to in the last week 52 percent of our listeners were in the uk 48 percent around the rest of the world and i see that we had listeners in the last week in uh, places as uh, diverse as qatar indonesia korea uh, and brazil so wherever you're listening to this podcast listener thank you for giving us your time uh, there's so much to listen to in the back catalog so just go to the ski podcast.com search around the tags and categories you're bound to find something of interest there now you can follow me at skipedia and the podcast at ski podcast but for now i'd like to thank intersport for sponsoring the show and thank all of my contributors today that's dave tim jen bernadette and the British racers, Dave, Billy, Laurie and Zach. And of course, my very special guest today, Jasmine Taylor. Thank you, Jasmine. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Finally, listener, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>